Well, good morning. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure for me to be able to participate in this particular setting, given the nature of what is going on presently. It is um, really an unprecedented uh, time for medical education. So with that, um, why don't we start about uh, giving a few tips and updates and tricks about salivary gland pathology. And of course, the title of something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue actually has an tuppence in my shoe, which is uh, one of the old adages that was applied to brides as they were getting married to wish them good luck in what they're doing. Well, I have tried to change that and discuss it instead for salivary gland pathology, and let's um, start um, right away. So um, if you think about general considerations for salivary gland pathology, it really is something that is um, quite uncommon, uh, less than 1% of all tumors. So it isn't really something that you come across very frequently. In general, they occur in adults. There's increasing frequency as uh, women have taken up smoking with Warfarin tumor. And I think, as you all know, uh, fine needle aspiration is definitely the line of first screening modality that is used in almost all of these head and neck um, lesions. Clinical stage is actually one of the most important considerations just in general. And of course, molecular techniques have also been um, employed in this particular arena. So if you look at uh, what has gone on with um, salivary gland uh, lesions in general, uh, the overall salivary gland component when I originally came up with a lecture several years ago, really only had about three or four tumors in which you were actually able to document anything about uh, the genetics or molecular findings. Now, of course, this is filled in very nicely with multiple different components being employed. And although I am not a molecular pathologist, clearly many of these particular findings can certainly augment in the diagnosis and sometimes even be involved when one is speaking about what goes on with um, treatment and long-term outcome of these patients. So it's always nice to put things in context. And so you may say, well, you know, why are you showing us something from 2003. Well, you know, the World Health Organization gets together and puts out uh, tumor classification books, and they're going to be a little bit more frequent now, but it has been um, quite some time. And so I thought, um, you know, if you put it in the context of 2003, yes, there I am uh, here in the corner. You will notice that I am uh, in the front row, and it is about me for this moment, because if you look at 13 years later for the exact same meeting, again, with the hum tumors of the head and neck, You'll notice that I didn't change at all. I'm in exactly the same location. Of course, my hair is a little bit longer. Um, this was a wild time in my life when I decided to let it grow out after leaving the military. But this is just to highlight that when you think about the salivary gland tumors, and it was incorporated in the chapter seven of the book, um, there were 42 different diagnoses incorporated in the salivary glands for the 2005 edition. And yet, if you look at the 2017 edition, there were 45 diagnoses that were encompassed at that particular point. So actually, only three new diagnoses. And if you think about it, secretory carcinoma, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, and introductal carcinoma were the lesions that were incorporated as the new entities. And so I'm going to choose to highlight just two of those particular topics today. So um, if you think about, you know, how the book was arranged, um, the overall classification really said, um, did a tumor occur primarily at this location? If it did occur at this location, is it important in um, the differential with other lesions? And maybe it may occur at other sites, but it has a predilection for this location. So what that ended up doing um, in the long term was actually saying, um, entities were only recorded once. So it really was an effort to try and reduce the overall volume of the book. So if you think about tumor distribution for salivary gland related lesions, and in this particular case, um, I'm going to highlight these in several different slides just to give you a general feel of what goes on with tumor site distribution. So if you think about it, first of all, um, major salivary glands with parotid and submandibular really account for 79 or 80 percent. So 80 percent of all of the tumors um, occur in the major salivary glands. If you then look at the minor salivary glands, again, you can see that the vast majority with 55% of them are occurring in the palate. So they really are major sites of predilection for tumors. Now, in contrast to this, if you look at the diagnoses, and I think this is an important thing to remember, and that is if you look at tumor distribution for the major salivary glands, pleomorphic adenoma, and then others like canalicular adenoma, basal cell adenoma, oncocytoma, et cetera, account for about 80% of the tumors. So when you're in a major salivary gland, just remember that eight out of 10 times, it's gonna be a benign diagnosis. 
So when you think about where you are in your practice or in your program, there may be biases that are inherent because if you're a referral center, if you're a major oncology center, et cetera, there's going to be a slight difference in that. But if you're out in general practice working as a general surgical pathologist, eight out of 10 times, it's going to be a benign diagnosis in the major salivary gland locations. However, if you now put this in the context of minor salivary glands, you will notice that in the minor salivary glands, still pleomorphic adenoma accounts for the one single majority diagnosis. However, as I look at that, 50% of the diagnoses in minor salivary gland locations are going to be malignant. So it is a difference based on where you are as to what the major category of lesion is going to be. So as a general rule, um, the smaller the involved salivary gland, the much higher the possibility of being in a tumor. And I have put in my little avatar there to tell you that knowledge is power. Because, you know, when you think about what goes on with benign versus malignant, things like the rate of growth, the relationship to the surrounding structures, circumscription and atypia are often quite significant in this particular setting. So if I put out a core needle biopsy like this and showed it to you, and I would say, well, you know, what is the chance that in this particular case, you're dealing with a malignancy or a uh, benign tumor. Well, hopefully, when you look at this, you can see that this particular area here probably has a pattern of an adenoid cystic carcinoma. But you know, if you first spent a couple of moments looking at the radiology and saw this as the size of the lesion from which that very thin cord needle biopsy had been obtained, I don't think that you would struggle nearly as much in the determination of what it is between benign and malignant. So I do feel that the clinical findings, the um, involvement, how long it's been involved, uh, which organs are involved and affected, and what the radiology findings are always extremely significant in this particular setting. So what I thought I would do today is um, go through four different virtual slides. I'm hoping that they will be able to project to you. I know that uh, lag times and speeds of transmission related to whatever your internet access um, speed may be could affect it slightly. So just remember that if you choose to look at this later on as a recording, hopefully those particular findings will be easier to examine than if you're trying to look at it um, live right now. So 73-year-old female presented with an enlarged right parotid gland. A fine needle, of course, was done, and then a parotidectomy was performed. So um, it's always nice to put a patient in context. This is clearly not the patient, right? But it's always nice to say, listen, there is someone else on the other side of what we're doing as a pathologist. And so let's go and look at this particular slide. So when I look at this just on immediate um, low power, uh, you can tell that there are multiple different patterns of growth in this particular case. Um, you can confirm that you are, in fact, in the salivary gland. You can tell that there is a small component of the parotid salivary gland compressed out to the edge. Here you can see easily identified carbonodecrosis um, throughout the entire center with kind of a fenestrated um, appearance to it. As you move around, you can see that it is expanding out into the adjacent um, adipose connective tissue, um, even little small islands out on its own. So you really can tell that this is a destructively um, invasive tumor. Now, each of these islands of tumor do have a slightly different appearance to them. But I think overall, they're kind of two major um, components. In this particular case, this is probably one of them. And then as you move over to this top part, you can see that there is another there. So let's go back to this particular space, and I'm just going to go up to an intermediate power initially, where you can see that there is a very blue quality to it, right? That definitely stands out to me as I look at this particular finding. And as I move up into a slightly higher power, I think you can see that there are these uh, lumen-type formations. Um, they tend to be um, slightly different in overall size and appearance. And then if I go to super high power here, I think all of you can see, even at this power, there are multiple small cytoplasmic blue dots. And those blue dots are easily identified in a subpopulation of this particular tumor. And I think that that is probably one of the features that is the most significant in this particular case. Let's go and look just over here for a moment and see that this is an area that has a slightly different overall appearance. I think you can tell that there is marked um, comedonecrosis. There is definitely an increase in the overall pleomorphism that you can tell. But, you know, as I go and look at this particular space again, even though I'm in these areas that are um, remarkably different and atypical, I think you can still see that those blue granules are easily identified here in the cytoplasm of this malignancy. So as I think about this, for me, this is an acinic cell carcinoma, and it does have high-grade transformation. 
which we will talk about in a few moments. So as you know, a cynic cell carcinoma is the um, malignant epithelial tumor that shows uh, serous acinar differentiation, and this is based on the presence of cytoplasmic dimogen granules. Um, it's the second most uh, common tumor uh, to be identified in the salivary glands, and of course, um, makes up about 10 or 12 percent of all malignant lesions. Ever so slight female uh, predilection with a wide age range at um, initial presentation, but just remember that it is still the second most common of the tumors that present in children after mucoepidermoid carcinoma. They generally give a very um, swollen appearance to the gland. Uh, there is no uh, um, eosinophilic appearance or ulceration, erosion, erythema, ulceration of the skin, and that's a significant finding because when you think about rapidly growing tumors, they are more likely to have that particular finding, whereas here it is just a smooth contour in this patient. So when you think about parotid gland being the most common, right, 95%, and the reason for this is it's serous acinar type differentiation, and that's where the most serous acinar are identified. So it definitely is the reason why more than 95% of the tumors occur in that location. I've put in minor salivary gland as being the most common, but I have put in this comment about doubting that, because with secretory carcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma being introduced recently, it seems that those particular tumors probably are not a cynic cell carcinoma at all and are classified as a different lesion. So by far and away, it's probably important to remember that a cynic cell carcinoma is a tumor of the parotid gland. Um, it is the most common of the malignancies to be bilateral, but let me just say that when you consider warfarin or even pleomorphic adenoma, they are much, much more commonly bilateral than you'll ever see in an acinic cell carcinoma. The cut surface is usually kind of a fish flesh type appearance to it, as you can see here, and this is actually related to a very frequent association with a tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation. The tumors are always quite nodular in their appearance. They don't tend <coughs> excuse me, to have a capsule. And so in this case, you can see that there are multiple nodules expanding way out into the adjacent um, parenchyma of the tumor. And it's very hard to tell where the tumor actually begins and ends. Given the anatomic site, it is not uncommon to have bone involvement. And so you may have involvement in the interstices of bone as it goes into the mandible, which is immediately adjacent to the parotid gland. There are a variety of different patterns that can be seen in a cynic cell carcinoma. Uh, one of the patterns is usually dominant and may be the only finding, but in general, it's a combination or a spectrum that is seen. And this ranges from the solid pattern, which you know kind of is the blue dot appearance, right? So this is the classical appearance of an acinic cell carcinoma. It's a basophilic granular cytoplasm that gives you that blue dot appearance. While in other areas, a small uh, microcystic pattern or lattice-like, even sieve-like appearance can be seen. While in other areas, large cysts with capillary projections, complex papillae, and even um, cystic spaces can be seen, creating almost a hobnail or tombstone type appearance. And then finally, the follicular pattern, which is quite frequently um, eosinophilic proteinaceous material in the lumen and looks very similar to what you see in a follicular thyroid carcinoma. So here is a solid appearance. I think you can see that it is still quite blue in its overall um, uh, visual. Here is a more sieve-like or fenestrated appearance for this particular tumor. An area of papillary architecture with multiple papillary projections easily identified throughout. And then finally, an area that shows um, follicular differentiation with secretory type material present in the lumen of this particular tumor. When you think about a cynic cell carcinoma, of course, the serous acinar cells are the most significant, and this is where you have that abundant granular cytoplasm with very strong resemblance to normal acini. But also remember that multiple different tumor constituent elements are also present. So these incorporate the intercalated duct-type cells, nonspecific glandular cells that have more of an eosinophilic cytoplasmic quality, clear cells, and then, of course, microvacuolated or vacuolated cells with large cytoplasmic vacuoles that are actually PAS and mucicarmin negative. So this is not a tumor that is arising just from a single cell type. There are multiple different cell types that are present within this lesion. So this is truly the classic blue dot type appearance. And if you're thinking about um, a tumor and its diagnosis, this particular finding is going to be the most helpful in reaching an interpretation. However, in other areas, I think you will still notice that there are areas that show 
these uh, granules in the cytoplasm, and those granules in the cytoplasm are still seen in some of the cells, or although certainly not all of them. And then you will notice the rest of the background cells making up the nonspecific glandular cells. Over here, you can tell that this is all made up of just the nonspecific glandular epithelium. Much more difficult if you're just in this field alone to be able to reach a diagnosis here of an acinic cell carcinoma. Here you can see multiple papillary projections with a hobnail type appearance, giving you that microvacuolated appearance. And again, without the granules in this one field, it would be quite challenging to at least consider that particular diagnosis. One of the common findings with a cynic cell carcinoma is the presence of a lymphoid infiltrate, and it can, can be remarkably prominent. And so that tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation, or TALP, is really very, very commonly identified. And in fact, when it is present, it's suggested that the patient will actually have a better overall outcome because they have a good host immune response to the lesion. So it may simulate a lymph node, and therefore it is very critical, especially when you're looking at fine needle aspiration, I'm sorry, when you're looking at frozen section type material, that you do not misinterpret this to be metastatic disease to a lymph node, because if you call it, they're going to likely do a neck dissection, which is frequently not necessary in this particular tumor. Ultimately, on the... Um, permanent material, a CAM 5.2 highlights the interfollicular dendritic cells, and therefore that helps to confirm that you're dealing with a true lymph node rather than necessarily just the tumor associated lymphoid proliferation. Finally, you can see a desmoplastic stroma, although it is quite an uncommon finding, but I'll illustrate that for you here in a moment. So here you will notice the tumor highlighted in yellow, and yet all of the rest of this background material is the lymphoid compartment. Another example here where it almost blends and merges with the adjacent tissue so the neoplastic uh, area highlighted in yellow definitely blends with the background of the lymphoid component. And this very, very heavy tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation can sometimes even obscure the tumor in some instances. This is an example of heavy stromal sclerosis. And in this area, I think you would be very hard-pressed to actually see are there any lesional cells present. In fact, they are. They are compressed in the background here. But when I look at this, it's very difficult to be able to say this is actually viable or live tumor. So when you think about a cynic cell carcinoma, there are some special stains that can be performed in this particular case. I still think that the PAS with diastase, because the zymogen granules can be seen, um, sometimes is the most helpful and useful. But I know everyone likes to do immunohistochemistry. So if you have it available to you, um, NR4A3 is the most sensitive and specific uh, immunohistochemistry study for this diagnosis. As you know, it's related to recurrent rearrangements that are seen in a cynic cell carcinoma. But DOG1 and SOX10 are also positive, while of course S100 and mammoglobin are negative in this tumor. So let's show an example. So as you can tell with the PAS, there is an accentuation of the uh, granules in a very nice luminal distribution. So when you look at these here, you can see that they are immediately adjacent to the lumen, which is a very helpful finding in this particular case to confirm the diagnosis. Here is the DOG1. You can tell a very nice, delicate membrane-type reactivity that can be seen um, in these neoplastic cells. However, the NR4A3 is very strongly positive in the tumor, which is illustrated on the far left-hand side, while the native parenchyma is not highlighted. And then, of course, when you look at the entire tumor field, all of them show a very strong nuclear reaction. It's very seldom that you need to do immunohistochemistry uh, to confirm the diagnosis, but if perhaps you were dealing with a core needle sample or something more limited where the histology was not characteristic, it certainly could be done. What is of further note is that this particular marker is positive even in the high-grade areas, and so it is maintained no matter whether you're dealing with a low or high-grade with um, high-grade transformation. So at this point, management um, is really surgical excision. Of course, if it's incompletely excised, you're more likely to have tumor recurrence and or metastasis develop later on. But in general, there is an excellent overall prognosis with stage being most likely to um, determine overall outcome beyond the histologic grade or growth pattern. But recurrences do develop in about 35% of cases. And unfortunately, dedifferentiation, which has now been correctly termed high-grade transformation. So high-grade transformation should be the term used for these particular uh, tumor types. But high-grade transformation just means that you have the residual acinic cell carcinoma somewhere in the background, and you've had high-grade transformation to it. So far, it's only reported in the parotid gland, and you will tell that the patients tend to be about 20 years on average older than conventional acinic cell carcinoma, 
So this does tell you again that there is an arc of development over time as the high grade transformation develops. You will usually have a juxtaposition or blending of the areas of low and high grade. And so as I was driving this case for you today that showed in a cynic with high grade transformation, you could tell how they really were very intimately uh, related with one another. The histology can be anything. So this is the thing that is the most challenging and it tends to be a bit undifferentiated with even a small or large cell carcinoma pattern quite frequently seen and even sometimes neuroendocrine type differentiation. So as the high grade transformation develops, any tumor category can be seen as that area of high grade transformation, but it's really important to identify that it was arising from an asthenic cell carcinoma. So high grade transformation is defined by tumor necrosis, increased mitotic activity, and anaplasia or pleomorphism present in the cells. And this is clearly what is seen in the example that I had shown driving. Let's look at it now. So you will notice the uh, benign area of the um, asthenic cell carcinoma, while highlighted with the yellow is the area now of transformation into a high-grade component. Another example here where you have the asthenic on the outer edges and the high-grade area of transformation, including regions of comedonecrosis in the center. Just highlighting that in one uh, instance here, the CK20, which is a marker actual, actually of the Merkel cell variant of small cell carcinoma in the salivary gland, was strongly positive in an area of a tumor that had previously been a cynic cell carcinoma with high-grade transformation. So again, a variety of different patterns can be seen in the high-grade transformation area. Okay, let's go on now to a different case, 57-year-old female who presented with an enlarged parotid gland. Again, a fine needle was performed and a superficial parotidectomy was done. So again, it's always nice to think of the patient that you're uh, looking at. And by the way, none of these patients obviously have these tumors. This is in full disclosure. I just pop myself into them with Photoshop to make it more entertaining. Let's look at the case. So I think you can tell um, this had had the previous fine needle, right? So here you will notice this very uh, large area of central loss. You will notice that there is abundant um, fibrous connective tissue being deposited around the central area. A lot of hemosiderin deposition over here with histiocytes, uh, no doubt the site of the previous um, aspiration. And I will say that these particular complications are even more well developed when a core needle sample has been done rather than the development instead with a um, fine needle aspiration. So I think you can tell that there are multiple nodules to this particular tumor as you go around. Um, it's separated out by um, fibrous connective tissue bands, and it is um, obviously expanding out into the adjacent parenchyma um, and partly um, invading into it. So when I look at tumors like this, um, my approach is generally to try and go to an area that is more towards the periphery, because at the periphery, you're more likely to have had an area that is better fixed and preserved, and therefore be able to see the cytoplasmic and nuclear details a little bit more easily. So in this particular case, I think here we are out at the periphery and it's a much easier area to interpret. So this is arranged in a um, glandular or acinotype configuration. Uh, I think you can tell that there is abundant secretion here, right? And it is actually quite remarkably uh, brightly hyper eosinophilic. Uh, so a very, very uh, prominent uh, secretory type material present within the lumen. Well, as I look at the neoplastic cells in this case, uh, they are just an amazing number of microvesicular or almost steatotic type appearance to it with almost a, a secretory looking a bit like maybe even adrenal cortex where it has just so many little vacuoles that are present in the cytoplasm. Clearly, there is scalloping of this material that is present in the lumen. And then if you go to super high power and look at the nuclear features, I think that you can tell that they are quite isomorphic. In other words, each of the nuclei look remarkably similar to one another. And there is an open vesicular nuclear chromatin with a single well-developed nuclear uh, nucleolus that is actually more accentuated towards the area of the nuclear membrane than necessarily being identified in the center. So one of the things that is always a tip off to me about the potential for a translocation or molecularly driven tumor such as this is that quite often it's monotonous. It's all very similar because if you think of a molecular driver for the tumor, they are all going to have a very similar overall appearance to one another. So in this example, it is secretory carcinoma. So when you think about uh, new tumor designations or new tumor descriptions or diagnoses, clearly 
they have always been around. It's just that we haven't called them that. So if you think about secretory carcinoma, ascinic cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, NOS, and other ductal-derived tumors were those that this particular tumor came out of. So there is really nothing new ever. It's just we've called it something else, or we've called it adenocarcinoma NOS or some other term. And now as our abilities to detect additional features are seen, we actually come up with the correct diagnosis. So if you think about it, it is um, a low-grade salivary gland tumor characterized by its resemblance to mammary uh, counterpart and an ETB6-associated gene fusion. I'm going to get back to that in a little bit. But just be aware that actually when you look at tumor volume, Salivary gland, breast, thyroid, skin, genital, urinary system, and so forth have all been identified to have secretory carcinoma. And in fact, even though this particular term has been borrowed from the breast, um, because that's where it was originally described, uh, salivary gland still now accounts for many more uh, tumor uh, frequency than it does in the breast. So when you think about the original name for this tumor, mammary analog secretory carcinoma, or MASC, so if you need to have a mnemonic by which to remember this, um, it's always nice to put it in the context of the person who described it. And so Mrs. Elena Skalova Carcinoma, or MASC, is just too hard to resist. And I certainly hope that she is watching, although I cannot imagine why. And if she are, it is. This is a fabulous shout out to her. So when you think about it, it's middle-aged patients, right? Um, a little bit more often in males, although it's not quite as dominant as you saw for the asthenic cell carcinoma. And by far and away, the majority of these tumors develop in the major salivary glands, although the oral cavity, upper lip, and retromolar trigone can also be affected. So generally, there is a lobulated appearance. It pushes out into the adjacent parenchyma without a well-developed capsule, so invading out into that um, parenchyma or stroma. The microcystic to glandular appearance is the most frequent, but of course, a papillary, solid or macro follicular, and even an oligocystic pattern can also be seen. And then, of course, what we look for is that eosinophilic homogeneous or bubbly secretory-like material in the lumen. So here on low power, you can tell that there's a lot of secretory material present in this tumor. And um, you can even see that there is a little bit of a tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation present here as well. When I look at the uh, tumor on intermediate power, you can tell that it has completely invaded and surrounded the native parenchyma highlighted with the yellow arrow. And you can tell that it is invading out into it without a well-defined uh, periphery or capsule. Sometimes a capsule is present, and I think if you didn't know where you were, because of course in this case you can see that there is a well-developed um, salivary gland parenchyma on the edge, but if you didn't know where you were, the possibility of even thinking about a papillary thyroid carcinoma would certainly come to mind, as you can see with this secretory type material present in the lumen. This is the classic appearance. It is a very bubbly appearance to the lumen. You can tell that the cells have um, abundant uh, bubbly cytoplasm, and you can tell that they are eosinophilic acellular fibrous bands that dissect between the tumor cells, creating these lobules or nests. When one looks histologically, they are very vesicular nuclei with finely granular chromatin, a very distinct nucleolus, ample cytoplasm, and then, of course, pneumorphism, necrosis, and mitoses are usually rare. However, whenever you have any of those three things, the chance that you have developed high-grade transformation must certainly be entertained. So this, again, is a very classic appearance, multiple areas of bubbly cytoplasm, uh, secretory material present in the lumen with scalloping around the edges, open chromatin appearance with a small nucleolus. Here you can see, however, that tumor necrosis is present, and so this would be a tumor in which high-grade transformation would, would need to be considered. There is usually a very well-developed acellular eosinophilic fibrous connective tissue, and in fact, it is uh, more frequently identified in certain uh, molecular translocation partners. So, um, you know, whenever you have a new tumor, you're always going to have a thousand immunos performed on it. And so I'm putting out a table of what has been done. But let me just assure you, in today's uh, environment of cost containment, there is no way that you're going to be able to perform all of these, whether they are positive or negative. And so you really should do uh, only three. Mam uh, mammoglobin, S100, and then either... P63 or DOG1. Uh, this gives you two stains that are confirmatory that are quite unique to one another in this particular tumor, while a negative stain would be of assistance in helping to exclude some of the other lesions that are considered in the differential. So my preference is actually to use P63 because it's just easy to interpret as a nucleus stain and very easy to um, look at when you have limited amount of material. 
So very strong and well-developed mammoglobin present here with um, a very strong cytoplasmic reactivity. You will notice that not all of the cells have a very um, heavy deposition. However, it can be quite different. So you'll notice this area over here tends to show um, much less reactivity in the cytoplasm. So just be aware that you can have differences in um, expression. S100 showing both a nuclear and cytoplasmic reaction in all of the neoplastic cells. And then finally, P63, just highlighting that in this particular case, you really are having a negative reaction in the background, um, but a few isolated cells um, in a basal location. Now, I've put definitional um, in uh, italics because originally the ETB6 NTREC and usually NTREC3 fusion was considered to be definitional for this particular tumor. But as more and more have been uh, evaluated and described, a wide variety of other translocation partners for ETB6 has been recognized, including RET and MET and even MAMMAL3. But then other translocations and fusions have been recognized with VIMRET and even uh, MIB-SMR3B. So the reason I'm bringing this up is many times if you have metastatic disease or chronically recurrent disease, they are going to request um, targeted therapy. So whenever targeted therapy is going to be employed, it's probably important in that particular setting to do NGS first in order to confirm what the specific finding is so that, in fact, you're going to be giving the correct targeted therapy. So here is an example of um, just a graphic showing the ETB6 NTREC3 fusion. And when you do a fish break apart here, you can clearly see that they are broken apart with the red and green dots uh, indicating that they have separated. I hope that this video will show, and it's just a lark to use between separating cases, but this is taken from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and it's an example of a jellyfish that has this really remarkable ability to create this fluorescence. And that fluorescence is very strong. And in fact, it is the gene from this jellyfish that was used to create the red fluorescence that is used in fish. So in fact, jellyfish are giving rise to what we use as fluorescence in situ hybridization. So when you think about the prognosis for secretory carcinoma, lymph node mets are seen in about 25%, local recurrence in 20%, and distant metastasis is really uncommon. High-grade transformation is seen in about 5%, and in this setting, clinical stage is much more important, um, as well as um, high-grade transformation, both being poor prognostic markers in this setting. So um, just to say that um, as we continue to look at these tumors, different variants are also described. So uh, my good friend, uh, Justin Bishop, just last year, put out a fabulous article on microsecretory adenocarcinoma. And this actually is associated with an SS18 fusion. So just be aware that as we look at these tumors, more and more uh, elaborate methodologies will allow us to subclassify them differently as we move forward. I also think... Um, Dr. Bishop is actually going to be giving you a lecture later on in this series um, in a few days, and I'm sure that you will enjoy that particular um, uh, lecture. So uh, mammary analog secretory carcinoma is now actually out of vogue. It is no longer used, and so this was the World Health Organization meeting where we all sat and said it must now be called secretory carcinoma. Um, there were some tears shed at that particular time because when you've put in your life's work into something and then see the name changed, but really, because they are more common in the salivary gland, secretory carcinoma is a much better term for it as an overall analogy. But still, in the evenings, we do have fun afterwards. And here is Elena Skolova uh, showing that she is enjoying herself with Nina. And of course, Bruce Winnig and Roddy Simpson. So now as we switch to our next um, category, I, I always like to you know, put in some sort of historical um, motif. And so here you can see this is a amazing uh, painting concepts along the walls uh, as the School of Athens done in the papal apartments in the Vatican City. So this is a, a straight-on view of that particular painting. Very complex, many, many figures involved in it, and you may say, you know, Lester, really, what the devil does that have to do with salary gland pathology? I'm going to show you. Look at this dude in the upper corner here. I'm going to bring him into high power because that's what pathologists do, right? And here, lo and behold, if he does not have a parotid salivary gland tumor, and he is showing it to the audience. Had this been a woman, she would have clearly moved her face the other way, as you can see the angel who's looking at it going, oh, my God, why do you have that? Okay, let's talk about the next case. Six-year-old woman, mass in the palate, noted while she was vocalizing, and an image showed extension into the sinus. 
So here you will notice that there is extension into the base of the maxillary sinus, beautifully illustrated on this computer tomography study. So again, uh, just highlighting a vocalizing patient for us as we go and look at the tumor. So when I look at this particular tumor on low power, I think, first of all, um, I always like to know where I am, right? I, I know I'm in California, but I mean where I am um, anatomically. And so when you look at this, you can see that there is an intact squamous epithelium. So you know that this is, in fact, taken from an intraoral location, and therefore you can confirm the site. So as I look at it again on low power, this is a multitude of different architectural patterns. No matter what I do, I can see that there are just a huge number of different patterns. They clearly expand out into the adjacent tissue. You can see that they are going out into the adjacent fat. As it curves around, you can tell that there really are multiple different patterns of growth easily identified. And in fact, um, if I go up to just high power for a moment, this is a very nice area where you can see that there is actually perineural invasion. And that's a nerve identified here in the center. So when you look at that, um, you can already confirm that it is entrapping the adjacent fat and expanding out into it. So you know that you're dealing with a malignancy rather than with a benign condition. So as I look at the pattern, you can tell that there is a whirling or a swirling type appearance to it with multiple different architectural patterns. I think if I go to slightly higher power, you will notice that there is a swirled, um, almost um, spindled appearance to some of the neoplastic cells, a linear architectural arrangements over here, a little bit more of a cribiform type pattern over here. Um, again, an area of nerve present here in the center, and then um, I think you will notice that there are these very nice um, crystalloids present here in the center as well, quite easily identified. Let's look at the nuclei, and it doesn't really matter where you do. Um, you can tell, again, that this is quite remarkably isomorphic. They are very bland, even though there is this wide architectural diversity. The nuclei tend to be very monotonous one to another. So polymorphous adenocarcinoma. This is the next category that we're going to tackle. And as you know, it has been recently separated out into two different types, low-grade and cribriform adenocarcinoma of tongue or tongue and minor salivary glands, um, also known as CAMS-G. So let's first talk about the low-grade. So PLGA, right? This is the old term that we used to use. And of course, the tumor was described um, many decades ago as a morphologic uh, tumor quite similar to lobular carcinoma of breast. And so again, you can see that there is often um, a borrowing from our um, uh, breast colleagues. The thing that is quite interesting to me about polymorphous adenocarcinoma, whether it is of the low grade or the cribriform adenocarcinoma type, is it's exclusively of minor salivary glands. There are some isolated reports of it being elsewhere, but in general, this is a tumor that I only consider when I'm in a minor salivary gland location. A little bit more common in women tends to involve the palate, and it tends to be a slow-growing lesion with a 96% tenure disease-specific survival. So this is why the low-grade terminology for this tumor is quite um, appropriate. As you know, it is the second most common of the intraoral salivary gland lesions, up to about two centimeters in overall size. And interestingly, it creates this very roughened or corrugated appearance of the luminal surface. So when I look at this uh, lesion uh, clinically, you will notice that there are these corrugations. So they create a rugated appearance or multiple folds along the region in this particular area. And that is quite characteristic and classic for polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade. And in fact, if you have a good clinician taking the sample, they will suggest that to you as they look at the specimen. So um, when you think about it, there is a intact surface with remarkable architectural diversity. So there's swirling, an eye of the storm or hurricane type appearance with a prominent targetoid center that invades out into the adjacent fat, incarcerates the normal salivary glands, and shows the single cell infiltration pattern. So with that in mind, let's look at the architectural diversity, which already I've shown in a little bit on the uh, slide that we drove. So an intact surface epithelium over the top. I think you can see the swirled type appearance of it. So let me put this in context. I mean, what are the statistical odds that there is going to be a hurricane luster. I mean, I just could not resist four years ago when this came out, and I thought this is going to be awesome. So when you look at it, it's obviously swirling, right? It is spinning with an area of central nidus formation in the middle, and that is exactly what you have with polymorphous adenocarcinoma, where in fact you have a central nidus right here in the middle that is the area of the nerve present. So this is very, very characteristic for this tumor. And in fact, if you want to confirm it, you can do an S100 protein, which highlights the central area 
of the nerve. And of course, there's also highlighting the tumor because that is one of the markers that is seen in this tumor category. So multiple different patterns is really the sine qua non of this tumor. So you can see the nerves that are present here in the upper portion. I'm only highlighting one of them with the yellow arrow, while the minor mucoserous gland is present below, um, completely surrounded um, by the neoplastic proliferation. It will invade out in these small luminal uh, aspects or maybe even single cell infiltration into the adjacent fat um, and very frequently will incarcerate or entomb the minor mucoserous gland. The reason this is important is it should not be misinterpreted that this is part of the tumor and therefore showing mucinous differentiation. Instead, this is just the native minor mucoserous gland being captured in the dead center, sitting there doing nothing, giving you an idea that this is actually a slow growing tumor because it just surrounds the neoplasm rather than being a rapidly growing tumor that would expand and destroy through this area. Single cell infiltration out into the adjacent stroma is quite frequently seen. And I think even at this magnification, you can see that there is a very nice slate gray <clears throat> bluish type appearance to the background material. So it is cytologically uniform though. That is really one of the clues to this. So you have architectural diversity, but cytologic uniformity. And those are the two features in combination for the polymorphous adenocarcinoma group. You do have that slate gray mixoid background uh, material that may undergo stromal hyalinization, made up of small cells, sometimes with spindling, abundant pale cytoplasm, and then those round nuclei with vesicular open nuclear chromatin. Mitotic activity can be seen, but it is generally scant and is not atypical. So again, the low power here, just to show you that slate gray blue material in the background with some focal areas showing hyalinization. Another example here with more tumor cell spindling but again, showing that nice bluish quality to the background matrix. Here it is hyalinized and it gives a much better appearance of almost a single cell infiltrating appearance, quite similar to what you can see with a lobular breast carcinoma, were you to think of that as one of the analogies. The nuclei are isomorphic. They all look very similar one to another. Open nuclear chromatin with a vesicular appearance of finely delicate chromatin distribution with the nucleolus present on the uh, membrane as well. Now, I have um, shown here that you can see mitotic figures. In fact, I've highlighted at least three in this just single high power field. Um, very hard to find, but I was able to do so and then thought, oh, I must highlight this feature. Um, because you can have mitoses in a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma category, but just remember that if I see a lot of mitotic figures or atypical forms, my index of suspicion for the next tumor category of cribriform adenocarcinoma definitely would come to mind. So the immunohistochemistry for this tumor is of a single cell population, and that is the most significant finding. It is positive with keratins, of course, and SOX10S100 and P63, but interestingly negative for P40. The genetics for this tumor are a hotspot activating mutation present in the PRKD1 uh, gene, and I'll highlight a difference between that gene and what happens in cribriform carcinoma in a few moments. So here you will notice all of the neoplastic cells staining positively with a pan cytokeratin, all of them reacting with an S100 stain. Whereas here, only the duct that is a native duct is present here in the center, being highlighted with the basal zone of the P40, where only isolated nuclei are present in the background and not nearly to the positive strong degree that you have in the basal zone immediately around the space. So when you think about um, the dichotomous staining, obviously the surface overlying epithelium is going to be positive for both P63 and P40, but the P63 is the only one that is positive in this tumor while the P40 tends not to be immunoreactive. Okay, let's go on now to the final case uh, that we're going to drive. A 78-year-old also um, identified a palatal mass while she was vocalizing, and this also expanded up into the overall uh, region of the maxillary sinus. So uh, why don't we take Babs for a spin here and uh, show the tumor that she had. And you know, I, I know it's not the right thing to do and I'm going to just rotate this image because there's something to me about being up and down that I would like to highlight in this particular case. So as I look at this lesion, I think you can all tell that there is a very well-developed region of ulceration. Um, whether this is native to the tumor in this instance or maybe just a finding that is seen um, after a previous biopsy of the site is a little bit difficult to tell. But nonetheless, it is um, about a surface ulceration. Now, interestingly, I think even at this power, and I'm going to go a little bit higher up, 
um, because it's just so well developed here. Do you see all these gorgeous islands where there is um, neoplastic cells present in the lymphovascular spaces? And this is just so characteristic of why this tumor will ultimately develop lymph node metastasis to a much higher degree than anything else. So um, it is often not easy to see, but I think in this case, it's just gorgeously well-developed um, and easy to detect and identify. So as I look around the periphery, you can tell that there are minor mucoceros glands present over here. This is a little bit of bone. And actually, even though I don't see um, neoplastic cells present in the bone itself, um, it certainly is destroying the bone right here. And you can see that there is remodeling going on of the bone as it has expanded into the area of the um, hard palate. Um, oh, by the way, here, this is a good area to see that I think there is even some area of central necrosis present in that space. So as I look at this tumor, there are multiple nodules of um, tumor, uh, very uh, sharply circumscribed with an eosinophilic um, bands of fibrous connective tissue, and then multiple different patterns of growth. I think this space very nicely highlights that you have areas of papillary architecture over here, a bit more of a cribiform type pattern over here, maybe remarkably cribiform in this space. And then, of course, areas of central comedonecrosis. I think all of you would agree with me that this is an area of comedonecrosis in the center. So when one looks at the areas of cribiforming, uh, they are quite easy to detect. Um, there is a papillary architecture present over here that is also um, readily identifiable. And perhaps if you have um, you know, a bit of a good imagination, the idea that maybe this is a glomeruloid type formation um, they are often quite difficult to identify just in any individual high power field, but still a glomeruloid type appearance is noted. And then if I go to super high power just to show you the nuclear features, I think that all of you would agree that this is in fact a very open vesicular nuclear chromatin that is quite remarkably a mimic for what you see in papillary thyroid carcinoma. So um, this is the cryptiform adenocarcinoma type. And as you know, um, sort of the new kid on the block, it's uh, originally a tumor that was described in the tongue. So cribriform adenocarcinoma of tongue. Then it was tongue and minor salivary glands, so it expanded into cat's MG. But cribriform adenocarcinoma is really the architectural pattern. And the most important reason to separate this out from polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade is the fact that up to 50% of patients will have lymph node metastasis at the time of presentation. And therefore, there will be a difference in the overall management of these patients than what you would have with PLGA. So you noted from what I drove that there was very well-developed lymphovascular invasion, and this is why they have such a high incidence of lymph node metastasis. They tend to be unencapsulated, um, still with an intact squamous epithelium, although if there's been previous biopsy, ulceration may be seen. Central comedo necrosis and this very remarkable difference between cribiform, microcribiform, tubular, and solid patterns all blended with one another, creating kind of a glomeruloid appearance to it with even peripheral palisading. So on low power, you can tell multiple nodules of tumor separated out by these bands of fibrous connective tissue below an intact surface epithelium. Uh, multiple nodules, again, a slightly different tumor dissected out by the bands of acellular eosinophilic fibrosis. Another example here where I think that you will be able to see that in this case, you are already beginning to see that there are areas of papillary architecture and perhaps even an area of degeneration seen in the center. Bone destruction can be seen, of course, because again, this is a tumor that can invade into the adjacent bony structures, and so it's important to recognize that that finding can be seen. Tumor necrosis is a helpful finding that is not seen in the low-grade category, but instead is only seen in the cribiform pattern type. This shows multiple fenestrations or cribiform architecture, again, separated out by that fibrous connective tissue bands that is really quite characteristic for the neoplasm. Um, this collagenized fibrous connective tissue stroma will be seen running between these lobules of tumor, but here the papillary architecture, I think, is quite easily identified. Areas of reverse polarization or palisading can be seen as noted in this example. And here you can now tell areas of kind of a glomeruloid body, right? So there are these fenestrated areas or cribiform architecture um, that are aggregated around a central lumen that you would see in a glomeruloid body. Sometimes different patterns are juxtaposed next to each other. So the left-hand side demonstrates an area of cribiform architecture, while a solid pattern with kind of a glomeruloid appearance to it is seen in the right-hand side. Multiple papillary projections are easily identified in this case, and clearly this is not a feature that would ever be seen in a polymorphous adenocarcinoma low-grade. So 
So automatically, the category of tumor can be separated out from one of the differential considerations. I think this is a good example of a glomeruloid body. I've been uh, dancing around that particular diagnosis for a few moments, but this really is a nice example of it. Reverse polarization. So away from the areas of vascularity, you will notice that the nuclei definitely palisade and, in fact, give you a subnuclear vascularization similar, actually, to what you can see in a secretory endometrium. And so if you want to have an analogy, that is kind of a good one to remember in this location. Somoma bodies may be present in some of these cases as highlighted here, but this is just to highlight that very open vesicular nuclear chromatin, which can be separated out by these very nice um, fibrous septa. They often will have some slight uh, clefting between them. And then, of course, the cytoplasm is clear uh, around the neoplastic cells. So again, the similarity to papillary thyroid carcinoma is quite remarkable in this tumor. Here you can tell fibrous connective tissue bands separating out into lobules. Another area here where there is even hemorrhagic degeneration and kind of a mixoid or bluish quality to it. So again, you can tell that there may be some overlap with what you see in the low-grade category of polymorphous adenocarcinoma. However, the papillary structures are very easy to identify, as you can see here, and again, removes you immediately from the category of the low-grade tumor, because this is usually seen in only cribriform adenocarcinoma um, with papillary structures. The monotony of the cells is easy to identify here, and I think you can see that there is an open vesicular nuclear chromatin quality, highlighted again over here with that open nuclear vesicular um, quality with small nucleoli, and I'm going to highlight just one mitotic figure that is present in this case, just to make you recognize that, in fact, you can have areas of... Um, increased mitotic activity uh, in this tumor. Metastatic disease to a lymph node just highlights the fact that this is one of the most common findings in this neoplasm. So again, it's still going to be exactly the same immunophenotype. Um, it has the same uh, pattern as you have seen with the polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade, so I'm not going to highlight it again. But I will highlight that there is a completely different genetic appearance rather than having a hotspot mutation. Here it is a fusion or rearrangement of that same PRKD1 with multiple different fusion partners identified. For those of you who are um, not within the United States, I would like to just highlight for a moment that um, reporting guidelines for all salivary gland tumors can be downloaded easily and freely from the International Collaboration on uh, Cancer Reporting, or ICCR, which is a global attempt to try and get standardization of terminology and reporting. And this particular one for salivary glands, of course, there's one for each of the major um, anatomic sites within the head and neck. So let's talk about the differential just in the last closing minutes here. And of course, I think I've already spoken about the separation of cribriform adenocarcinoma from uh, PLGA. So let's talk about the others. So uh, this is when, of course, you're on the fence and trying to decide which diagnosis to uh, come up with. So it may be very difficult on a small biopsy. Certainly, if you just get a small amount of tissue, especially with minor salivary gland location, it can be quite challenging because pleomorphic adenoma is not encapsulated, um, and they can have this nodular and bosselated appearance. Certainly, if it's clinically recurrent, it may even expand out into the um, adjacent tissue. The cribriform pattern, though, is usually not seen in uh, pleomorphic adenoma, and of course, perineural invasion will not be seen either. It has a mixoid chondroid matrix material with plasmacytoid cells, and of course, is going to have a biphasic immunohistochemistry study where there are basal and myoepithelial cells that are differently reactive from the um, other luminal cells of the epithelium. So um, that is going to be the most uh, helpful finding in that setting. So here, I think you can see that this is a more solid area of a pleomorphic adenoma. In fact, um, I'll highlight just a little bit here that you can see that there are areas of even apocrine-type uh, presentation in the central luminal component uh, that is easy to see on this tumor. Um, a fenestrated look can be seen here, right? But notice that mixoid stroma in the background is actually um, dissecting through the entire tumor and present intimately with it rather than necessarily separating it out into um, lobules or nodules. Notice the plasmacytoid appearance of the neoplastic cells as well. Here it is expanding out into skeletal muscle. I'm showing this because this is a clinically recurrent tumor where it is well known that they can go out into the adjacent um, stroma. A bit more solid area, but I think you can still see that there are well-developed uh, gland duct lumen formation present in the background. I'm not highlighting an area here that shows any of the chondroid matrix material, but just to show how sometimes it can be challenging if you have limited material. 
However, if you do a CK pan, you'll notice that there is differential expression, but both compartments of the neoplastic proliferation are positive. Whereas here you can see that the GFAP is highlighting the myoepithelial or basal zone, much the same as what you see with S100, where it's highlighting the basal zone while not reacting in the central um, epithelial component, similar to what you see with P40. And of course, this exact same finding can be seen with P63. So again, the highlighting of multiple different compartments is quite significant in this tumor. If you really want to get fancy, you can do all of the stains in one where you can combine a, a different number of uh, antibodies based on whether they are reacting for a nuclear uh, marker or a cytoplasmic and which chromogen is identified. Personally, I do not care for these as they just drive me crazy because I can never remember which one is supposed to be staining what. Let's go to basal cell adenoma, right? So this is a small basaloid proliferation, high NC ratio, coarse nuclear chromatin, reduplicated basement membrane. And again, this is going to be a biphasic tumor. So um, if you think about basal cell adenoma and basal cell adenocarcinoma, they are separated with the fact that one will invade. There is also a difference in the CT and NB1 reactivity that is expressed with um, positivity with beta nuclear beta catenin, but I'm not going to go into that at the moment. Just to highlight here that you have multiple different patterns of growth, um, but that tubular architecture is quite easy to see. When you go up to higher power, the reduplicated basement membrane material separated between the areas that have well-formed tubules in a isomorphic but definitely basaloid appearance to this neoplasm. So um, this pattern looks very similar to what you would see in an adenoid cystic carcinoma, but this is in fact from an area of a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma and an area here that has kind of an adenoid cystic pattern, but this is taken from an area of cribriform adenocarcinoma. So this is to highlight that with adenoid cystic carcinoma as well, you can have multiple different patterns of growth, but in this setting, the cribriform architecture is by far and away the much more commonly identified. You don't tend to have a fascicular architectural arrangement or a spindle cell pattern, which is seen in PLGA. The nuclei tend to be much more peg-shaped or carrot-shaped, maybe angular if you prefer that, with hyperchromasia. And then, of course, a very prominent stromal clefting with glycosaminoglycan-type material. Um, perineural invasion is usually seen, but of course, that's not really going to help you because the tumor types that we're discussing here can have perineural invasion. But still, a biphasic reactivity will be seen for both epithelial and myoepithelial markers while CD117 will be reactive. So when I look at this on low power, I think you can see that the um, sieve-like pattern or cribiform type architecture is very prominent in this area. Uh, quite prominent here as well, where you can see that reduplicated basin membrane material curving through and intimately associated with all of the neoplastic cells that have kind of a hyperchromatic nuclear distribution. Stromal clefting is a very uh, helpful feature. You'll notice that it is separating out from the adjacent fibrous connective tissue between the epithelial compartment. And if you think about skin basal cell carcinoma, it's actually quite remarkably similar where you have this epithelial to mesenchymal um, uh, separation or artifact. Another clefting artifact here, just on low power to really highlight it with a much more um, solid to cribriform appearance, a bit more solid in this area, again, with the clefting artifact and highlighting a very strong uh, hyperchromasia to the nuclei. And when you look at them on very high power, this will have well-formed tubules or ducts type present within the proliferation that helps you to make the separation as well. Again, because this is a biphasic tumor, um, you're going to have different compartments present. And so here you can tell on this intermediate power, lots of reduplicated basement membrane that is actually crushing the neoplastic cells. And when you look on higher power, you'll see that there is also perineural invasion highlighted here, but that stromal clefting is quite easily identified. SOX10 will highlight a, a compartment within this tumor. As you can see, there are still several areas that are negative, um, as can be seen with the biphasic appearance. Smooth muscle actin, staining the basal myoepithelial cell compartment, but not staining any of the central luminal cells. And finally, even P40, giving you a very nice, strong myoepithelial or basal marker positivity while not reacting with the luminal component at all. So again, this can be a helpful finding in separating between these particular tumors. Of course, if you did CD117, it tends to give you a very strong reactivity pattern, usually in the luminal aspect preferentially. 
So this is an example of CAMS G that I think looks very similar to uh, what you can tell with canalicular adenoma, and that's why I've incorporated it in this case as well. So canalicular adenoma is one of the benign tumors, again, uh, arranged in an interconnected cord-like appearance, but of columnar cells, and usually associated with some sort of beading. And generally, they'll have a central luminal squamous morial or ball-type appearance with a background loose fibrous um, fibrillar stroma. So this tumor is not reactive with P63, P40, or smooth muscle actin, and so that is one of the findings that would be helpful as you look at this neoplasm. So here on low power, multiple different um, patterns, but I think you can tell the canalicular architecture with those central areas of ball-like formation. Another example here highlighting the columnar appearance to the neoplastic cells, and then over here is a squamous morial. But here you can tell that there are many squamous morials present in the center, with this pseudostratified columnar type periphery to it with the background fibrillar um, stroma. Here you can tell that characteristic beading where each of the sides of the canal come together and touch one another in the center before separating again, a very characteristic finding for canalicular adenoma. A curious finding is the presence of GFAP only out towards the periphery. It does not stain the central portions of the tumor, only the periphery, so that is a helpful feature. Um, also helping to separate from uh, pleomorphic adenoma if you uh, consider that as one of the differential lesions as well. Interestingly, you must always understand the type of staining that you have. So in this example, you will notice that the P63 is cytoplasmic, right? This is not what you're expecting to see. It should be a nucleus stain. So again, whenever you order immunohistochemistry, it is really important to remember that if you order one to be able to recognize which compartment is going to be positive in which tumor. And so for canalicular adenoma, if there is any P63 reactivity at all, it is cytoplasmic rather than what you would expect to see as a nucleus stain. Of course, the entire tumor is positive with S100. Now I will end with the notion of hybrid tumors. So if you think about hybrid tumors, of course they can exist. And so here is an example on low power first showing a polymorphous low grade on the left hand side and the cribriform adenocarcinoma on the right. Let's go to higher power and I think you can see that that on the top is of the low grade category while that on the bottom is the cribriform architecture with a slightly higher uh, nuclear grade to it. Viewed in a different area here, I think you can again see that the area of um, uh, low grade tumor is on the left while the high grade tumor is on the right. So the separation of cribriform adenocarcinoma and PLGA may be seen in the same lesion and hence um, hybrid tumors can certainly be identified. One final example here, just highlighting the PLGA on one side and the cribriform adenocarcinoma on the other. So I always try to um, put this in the context of a mnemonic in order to try and help people to remember what the differential diagnosis can be for these particular tumors. And so if you take the first letters of all of these cases, you will actually get CPE Bach, of course, one of my favorite composers, even though his father is the better known. And I suppose you just have to throw out the E in this particular case, but CP Bach will help you with the differential in this case. A few take home points. Remember polymorphous adenocarcinoma has two types, the classic or traditional low grade, and then of course the intermediate to high grade, which is called cribriform. They are a single cell type, even though they may, may have multiple patterns. The other tumors in the differential consideration tend to be biphasic. So in other words, they're going to have both epithelial and myoepithelial markers in a biphasic distribution, rather than being in a single cell population. And then of course, remember that the chromatin is usually quite fine and delicate. Finally, if you have necrosis or increased mitotic activity, any sort of papillary or cribriform architecture, put it in the cribriform adenocarcinoma category because you want to at least influence management in that particular case. With that, I wish you a world of salivary gland pathology.